All right. I am here with Marianne Reese. Hello, Marianne. Hi, how are you? Great. How are you? Great. Great. Good. And you're one of the top negotiators in our office. So not our office, our city. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about today is negotiating the inspection addendum. But just so people know who you are, you do business in Cincinnati, Ohio, you do business in Kentucky, and you just do business now in Florida. Congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. Well, tell us what some of your tips are for negotiating these inspections. Okay. Um, I think one of the, th and this is negotiating in general, especially mm -hmm. in real estate, because there's so much emotion involved. Yeah. Um, the word fair is something that I probably overuse um, because when, it, so, so when I'm talking to, let's say I'm talking to a seller and we have an inspection addendum mm -hmm. and they are like, I'm not fixing anything. It's a seller's market, you know? And right. I'm like, okay, well, if you were the buyer, what would you think would be fair? Mm -hmm. Which kind of gives them a different spin on it. And it might, like, I imagine it kind of like calms them down a little bit. Cause I can see that, right? Like, especially in this market, it's like, why are they even asking me for anything? Like everybody's releasing inspections and things like that. Right. And, and of course, and you know, that, that is also a strategy when you're negotiating a contract to try to get inspections, at least in the right frame of mind, you mm -hmm, know, so mm -hmm. we'll often put in um, inspections are for information purposes only. Right. Um, the buyer does not intend to, ask for any repairs or monetary settlement as a result of inspections. Or like putting a cap on it or something like that. Yes. So that's that's one strategy. But getting people to look at it from the other person's point of view, I call it the golden rule of negotiation, is, is, is critical to any negotiation. But I think it's what ultimately can keep deals together. And then there are some creative things that if monetarily it's not possible mm -hmm. like if the seller doesn't have money to make repairs and the buyer doesn't have the money to make the repairs how do we get through that right um, so but everybody agrees that it should be done or whatever let me just quickly create some contact so you do a lot with older homes and by older homes i mean these homes are like 100, 100. 100 right and how many deals have you lost because of inspections in my career or in like, yeah, your career, how many, how long you've been in real estate over 20 years, right? 16 years, 16, so be, this will be 17 years this year. Yeah. 2004. Um, I, not many. I mean, we yeah. really don't lose many. And I think that it's because of, you know, my, my previous career was all about negotiating, you know, mm -hmm. calling corporate Kroger, which is a challenge in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, the negotiating skills, tactics, whatever you want to call them, you know, kind of translate. Um, but so, so let's, let's say you have an inspection and there's, and the chimney, there's something wrong with the chimney. It's a $5,000 repair. Nobody has $5,000. The, okay. the buyer doesn't have it. So some of the things that we have done, one is that you can put, um, put the money into seller paid closing costs, prepaids and out-of-pocket expenses. If the okay. seller can take less as a net. Okay. That's one strategy. Um, you can put part of it, you know, to kind of a compromise, 2,500 mm -hmm. in seller paid closing costs, what have you. And then we have been successful, especially in lower price points where money is scarce um, in building it into the contract. So in other words, the house is listed for 200 mm -hmm. and our buyer um, offers, let's say there's no multiple offers, but they offer 205, okay. $5,000 in seller paid closing costs. And then we drop into paragraph 16 that the $5,000 in seller paid closing costs is to be used for any repairs that the buyer requires as a result of inspections. Mm -hmm. And if they... Um, if they, if it's not all used, so let's say it's $4,000, uh -huh. the other thousand dollars goes towards their closing costs, prepaids and out-of-pocket expenses. Nice. Do you so ever put it on like on the settlement sheet to get paid to the vendor? If the uh -huh. seller, yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, very, very frequently. Some lenders are really weird about that. Um, and I, I don't really understand why. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times you can have it um, not on the addendum, not mm -hmm. on the addendum that the lender sees. Mm -hmm. You put it on a separate addendum and then the title company sees it and cuts the checks. And that works well. That works. Yeah, well. that does work well. What if you have a situation where, because I, I hear you in the first part, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, okay, let's try to get everybody to be in the other person's shoes, right? Mm -hmm. But like, what if one of, like your client is calmed down, they can see the other person's side, they're doing what they feel is fair, but the other side is like, absolutely not. We're not taking that. Like, what are some suggestions around helping them calm, <laughs> I guess, calm down and keep the deal together? Yeah. Um, well, and sometimes it's a matter of perhaps their agent is not super experienced. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I often do is say, how about if I write a letter to you, Jen, mm -hmm. that kind of explains the seller's point of view okay. and then you can present it to your client. And the benefit is it's coming from me instead of from you. That's a good idea. So it's kind of like doing their job for them. Right. But you have to frame it up in a way that they don't feel like you're doing your. Well, yeah, job. because you're really doing a service to your client. Yes. As yes. Yeah. But it's also easier to present. And I have asked other agents can you write the letter, send it to me yeah. so I can present it to my client who's being difficult and make it come from you, Jen, instead of me. Right. Well, yeah, because sometimes people like don't necessarily listen to you, but they'll listen to somebody else saying the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. that's yeah. good. What are, um, do you have another tip for us on how you're able to keep things together when, especially if it's like contentious or they don't agree? Um, well, some, some loans require the repairs to be done prior to closing. Mm -hmm. And that's a tricky thing. So I think it's really important to develop a very strong stable of contractors that have really good financial wherewithal. Mm -hmm. And I'll use this example. This might, might've been the most difficult transaction I've ever been involved in. Mm -hmm. So they bought this house that was done as a remodel, but the poor person that had purchased the house to remodel it got sold a bill of goods. Oh. Um, look up Edgar Construction if you if you want more details and mm -hmm. watch the videos from the news and you'll cry because these people were really taken advantage of. But anyway, so he bought this house. He tried to remodel it. He didn't know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the electrician said it looks like a 10-year-old got a book on electricity Oh my God. Do the electric work. So there was thousands of dollars worth of electric work. He took out a wall and didn't put a support beam in. Oh no. Up the house. I mean, it just was one thing after another. And these buyers really wanted to buy this house. So we had all of the work done prior to um, the closing. And uh -huh. then the and then the contractors were paid at closing, but we're talking about thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of work. That's a so, big risk. Yeah. So it was very um, important that we had the right contractors that first right. of all could carry that until right. closing, right? But secondly, that were you know willing to trust to trust us. Yeah. But it was pretty. It was, that's that crazy. Was I mean, that's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. What do you think about when you are negotiating? Are you doing this? Like, what is the mode of communication with the other agent or with your clients? Well, I, I always tell people this. Anytime anything gets really challenging, um, the best thing you can do is say, I'll be over in 10 minutes and mm -hmm. get in front of your client. I mean, look at them in the eye, have a face-to-face -face mm -hmm. conversation. The next best thing, of course, is the phone. Right. Um, but negotiating over text just flat out isn't going to cut it. Right. And the other thing is the tone can be so misinterpreted with exactly. email and text. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you are going to communicate with email or te I don't recommend to text at all, but with email, um, then I would have someone else read it before yeah. I send it and see, and almost always, you know, cause my, my husband is the brakes on the gas and almost <laughs> always he will say, you know, tone it down. That's too strong. You know, <laughs> you're being overly aggressive yeah. with the other. Yeah. I'm overly aggressive. So yeah. That's how I am too. I've been told I have hostile communication. I was like, that sounds right. That's true. You know, <laughs> so maybe you should have an accountability partner that I need a Steve yes. because we know your heart is not hostile. I know it's that. True. It's true. It's true. Well, I think those are really, really good tips. I especially like the first tip about, you know, what, what's fair here? Like, what do, did you ever read that book? Never split the difference. Um, Maybe I've read a ton of books on negotiation. Yeah, he's know. like a, um, he was like a hostage negotiator, I think is what he was. I listened to the audiobook. I remember. Yeah, do you remember it? Mm -hmm. What um, I'm trying to remember, like what his main points were on negotiation. Do you remember? Well, I think that if I remember right, you know, he's negotiating with hostages, so or people that are holding. sometimes though, I feel like we're negotiating with terrorists. Yeah. So, so I think that the main thing is to try to get people's trust mm -hmm. and to make sure that they, um, understand that you have their best interest in mind. And, um, you know, it's, yeah. we, this is amazing. When you say, what, you know, have, how many deals have you had fall apart? The last one that we had fall apart, which is probably six months ago, um, this house was amazing. It's, it's pending again. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just the, the worst, the absolute worst quality of workmanship I've ever seen anywhere, anytime, no matter what. Wow. And the, and the, the buyer was ready to walk away before I was. And I was like, I think, I think we can hang in there. I know that this is this is a really good spot for your family. I think that we can get through this, but the straw that broke the camel's back <laughs> was that we had the sewer line scoped. Okay. They had given us a receipt that they had had the sewer line flushed. And then we had the sewer line scoped and literally there were towels, towels in the sewer line. What? I don't know how, I don't know how they could get them flushed down the toilet, but anyway, they were there. And so I, sent him the video and sent him this. And I'm like, whoever you paid to flush the sewer line didn't they do did not. And he accused me of taking, he had, he, there was an empty package of paper towels in the house. And he said that I flushed three rolls of paper towels down. Why the would you do that? Why? Well, I, I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea what he was. This doesn't thinking. even make sense. I have no idea what that was about, but maybe anyway, he did it. But I, I said to, I said to the buyers, you know, I, I, um, I never let the ball die in my court. Never. But I, I just think that these people are crazy and I don't, I'm afraid of what we can't see that's mm -hmm. going to happen in this house after right. you buy it. And, yeah. and there was, I'm going to say 60, $65,000 worth of negotiation on repairs. That's insane. How it, much was the house? What's that? Everything except for the sewer line. Was it, how much, how much was the house? Uh, I think we were, uh, under contract at 595. So more than 10, well, let's call it 10%. That's crazy. It was a mess. That's a lot. It yeah. Usually insane. inspections. I'm pending again. I, if it closes, I, I just feel so bad for the buyers. The new buyers. Yeah. yeah. I think though, like to your point about it is important to have your clients know that you have their best interests at heart. And I still think you can, there is good faith of creating like a win-win solution versus like a, I win, you lose solution, right? Well, that doesn't close. I win, you lose doesn't close. No. And Almost. I don't think it means that it always has to be like, it doesn't have to be like, even like if this is the repair and it's $5,000, it doesn't have to be 2,500 each. Mm -hmm. Cause that may not, that could also, that could be a lose, lose, right. which also doesn't work. Right. But there's yep. gotta be like, it's kind of like, how do you get to that win, win 
solution to me is just asking a bunch of questions. Yep. 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 You have, and, and, but, and I think that, like I said before, I think the primary question is if you were the buyer that just paid $25,000 over list price, right. On a $200,000 house. Mm -hmm. And you find out that the sewer line is compromised. Right. Would you think it is fair to ask them to take on that repair in addition to paying $25,000 more than you were asking Mm -hmm. for the house? Well, and how do you want to deliver the house? Like your name is on here. And in most cities, people know people, you know, and most people don't move that far away from where they live. So it's like, is, is that what you want your signature on? Is this house? Yeah. I've never asked that question, but. (laughs) <laughs> I'll put that in my back pocket for sure. <laughs> I've asked it, you know, in a different way, like, but ask that question, especially when I can see that they have been very meticulous about the house, but something was missed, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, they get up in an uproar because they've been so meticulous, but it's like, but yeah, but this was missed. Like, shouldn't I we continue thought, that? I just thought of another really important thing that hmm. we, I think we as agents often forget is that sometimes things that come up on inspections can be covered by your homeowner's insurance. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have a roof that needs to be replaced and a roof is, it's always, it's always a tough one because it's expensive. Right. No seller wants to sell, not wants to buy a roof for a house that they're not going to live in anymore. No buyer wants to buy a house and put a roof on it. But a lot of times with a roof, you can get the insurance insurance might might cover it if it has storm damage. It depends. Right. It just depends. So that's always something that is hard to remember, but certain things like, um, like the sewer line is Mm -hmm. one that, you know, I would say it's less than 50% now, but some homeowners insurance covers compromised sewer lines so yeah I think it's especially in these like maybe in these older homes where they're paying a premium to cover some of this stuff mm-hmm. it's worth a call anyway on something that's really expensive that yep. makes sense that's a good idea and a good home warranty is all can always try to it can bridge the gap it can help to get people like we have one that's closing next week and the furnace isn't old but it had some rust in it Mm-hmm. So we had the, um, the seller agreed to have it serviced. Okay. And then the important thing about that is that we get a clean bill of health on the furnace. So the furnace is working properly. Right. And that you have, to, and that has to be documented before closing. And, and also has to say that the heat exchanger is not cracked. Mm-hmm. And so once you have that documentation, then the home warranty will cover it if something were to happen to the firm. Right. So just understanding what needs to happen and if there is a claim. But like I, had a, I had an agent recently that said, why did you have the furnace? Um, why did you have the furnace inspected? And I'm like, because I wanted the home warranty to cover my client if something happened to the firm. Right. <laughs> she thought that was just ask asking for trouble. Oh, like, well. Okay. oh, well, <laughs> whatever. Well, I really appreciate you being on. Those are some good you. tips. If people do have a referral for you in Ohio, Kentucky, Florida, or where's next, where do you want Portugal, Colorado? <laughs> Colorado? Oh yeah. That makes sense. Yep. If people have a referral for you, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Five, one, three, four, seven, zero, zero, five, six, four is my phone number. And then my email address is Marianne Reese at gmail.com Reese. And it's M-A-R-Y-A-N-N-R-I-E-S as in Sam. Awesome. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.